Steelers rookie camp is over, which means we need to talk about how some of these rookies looked. Not like we were going to learn much about their football prowess and just shorts and T-shirts and what running around. But getting to talk to them for the first time at a Steelers practice, that was a bit interesting. Ray Fittipato had some good questions that were answered by Broderick Jones. We'll get into that and how the Steelers are looking to protect Kenny Pickett with a, with a rookie left tackle potentially as well as how the Pirates are, are doing. Mitch Keller with another stellar start. We'll talk about that with Jason Mackey. All that and more here on the North Shore Drive podcast. It's the Monday edition from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, joined today by Ray Fittipato, one of our Steelers beat writers here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. We'll later be joined by Jason Mackey, one of our Pirates beat beast reporters here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. As always, you can find the North Shore Drive podcast on your favorite podcasting app, whether it's Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever. But you can also find it on YouTube right here. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of our daily content, as well as the Monday, Wednesday, Friday episodes of the North Shore Drive podcast, where we talk all things Pittsburgh sports. Ray, we just went through rookie, rookie camp. It's the time of the year where you share a clip of their first round draft pick doing some simple, simple foot drills. And people are like, oh man, Super Bowl, it's coming. And you saw the excitement from just people seeing Broderick Jones do some basic drills. But I did think it was cool that we getting to, we got to talk to these guys, not over the phone, not after they've got drafted, but right. now like they're starting to get their first tape of what it's like to work with these, with the Steelers staff and get getting things used to here. And Ray, you had an interesting question for Roderick Jones about his if he's if he becomes the day one starter his first tech test will be Nick Bosa who's right up there with TJ Watt as among uh, among the best pass rushers in the NFL but then even looking further you're gonna have Miles Garrett the week after that Max Crosby the week after that potentially Will Anderson the third overall pick for the Houston Texans the week the week after that this could be a gauntlet for uh for 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 um for Broderick Jones and I, I think that's something that the Steelers need to be prepared for yeah, absolutely. You know, right before I asked that question about Nick Bosa, uh, somebody else asked him, does he expect to be the starter by week one? And he gave a very politically correct answer to that. He basically said, I'm here to work and, you know, let the chips fall where they may sort of thing. But when I followed up and I asked him who the opponent was, and you got to remember that schedule was released maybe 12, 16 hours, you know, before we, we talked to him, he knew exactly who they were playing he knew exactly who the, the best edge rusher on that team was. So uh, he's a very focused in, individual. Um, he knows what lies ahead of him. And uh, we'll see if he could earn that job. But, Chris, as you point out, it's a gauntlet in the first month of the season uh, for opposing edge rushers. I mean, you not only Nick Bosa, but you got Miles Garrett, um, who has always been among the league's top sackers. Yeah. And then you got Mason Crosby, uh, in the first road game at Vegas, that's not going to be an easy chore either. So we'll see how that goes. But I, I thought it was very interesting that Broderick Jones knew exactly who the player, who the Steelers were playing in the season opener. Is he a day one starter? Like he's the first, he's the first round pick that they traded up to get. But do you think that they need to protect him? And, and by protecting him, also protecting Kenny Pickett, who we'll get to in a minute here in the right. second segment. But <laughs> You know, Dan Moore Jr. has been the starter for two years, and he's done well against Miles Garrett in some of these in, in some of these games. Is that something that the Steelers need to be kind of aware about? Like, you know what? Hey, maybe don't throw Broderick Jones into the fire right away, or should he be ready for that? Yeah, I mean, you have to remember um, a couple of things when you invest that high of a pick in a guy. He's going to become the starter sooner rather than later. Uh, right. Later, I, I did some research on this um, over the weekend, Chris. Um, the last time a uh, Steelers first round pick did not start the opener was 2016 when Artie Burns uh, was the first round pick. I think he was number 25 overall. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I remember correctly, they had a need to start him that year, but he had a, uh, an injury or two in training camp. I think Sean Davis had an injury or two in training camp and that mm -hmm. kind of just messed up what their plans were going to be for that season. Artie ended up starting nine games out of the 16. So he, he eventually worked his way into the lineup. But the point being, if Broderick Jones remains healthy, if he proves that he's better than Dan Moore, 
I would expect him to, to go out and, and to be the starter on day one. Um, but there are some other things that you do have to take into account, you know, much in the same way they did this with Kenny Pickett last year after kind of a tough opening stretch. Right. They kind of eased him in when, um, you know, the, the schedule got a little bit lighter. Um, would they want to do that with uh, with Dan Moore and Broderick Jones? You know, we'll have to wait and see. But, um, you know, if you look at it and you look at the competition early, specifically the edge rushers, and not only the 49ers, Chris, uh, not only Nick Bosa, but the 49ers defense Yeah, is the number one uh, team in total defense, the number one team in scoring defense mm-hmm. in 2022. So it's, it's going to be a tough assignment o- overall. So do, do you just throw Dan Moore – to the dogs again for the first month of the season. And, you know, he'll probably have similar results. Or do you throw Broderick Jones out there and say, hey, learn on the job, big guy. Let's see what you can do. It's going to be a very interesting summer to see how that develops. And that's a defense that's now added Javon Hargrave to the mix. Like, yep. they got better, which is crazy to think with how good that the Niners were on defense last year. I mean, that was a team that was effectively winning games almost into the Super Bowl with Mr. <laughs> Irrelevant at quarterback. Like, Right. That is how crazy good that defense was last year. And that's a heck of, heck of a start. But as you and I kind of talked about, or I think Brian and I kind of talked about last Friday, excuse me, but, you know, getting that team early on in the season might have been a hitting blessing for the Steelers because the Steelers have been very good in in in, uh, in, in openers of, of late. You saw them beat the Bengals uh, last year. You saw them beat the Bills the year after that. And those are both on the road. In fact, they've won three straight uh, week one games uh, over the past three seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the last time they lost was to the Patriots in 2019. Uh, but those were two of the premier teams in the AFC. And now you get a premier team in the NFC and they're coming to your house for the first time since 2014 has any, has the Steelers had an home, had a home opener that they, that they could use. And I just, I look at this and I think like, man, like, yeah, sure. There's a lot of things to be worried about, but the Steelers, they've schemed around that before. When Dan Moore Jr., when they knew that he was going to be in a tough match, matchup, they would bring extra tight ends his way. They would tell Najee Harris to help him out, or they would just say, hey, get the ball out quick. This might be something that they're more prepared for than I may be giving them credit for uh, in, in not just Broderick Jones, but just in making sure that they're protecting Kenny Pickett. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how the coaches approach this, Chris. I just go back to other first round picks over the years. Um, and let's talk about offensive linemen. Marquise Pouncey, I think they kind of eased him in in OTAs and rookie minicamp, but he was with the starters within the first or two day, first or second day of training camp uh, back in 2010. He took that job away from Justin Hartwig. So, you know, is Justin Hartwig a better football player than Dan Moore? Uh, you know, they won a Super Bowl with Justin Hartwig. So, you know, I would tend to think that he was. So it it comes down to whether Broderick Jones is ready or not. I think, you know, Marquise Pouncey was a special player. Um, but David DeCastro, if not for that injury, he would have been a day one starter. You know, he got injured in camp and then he couldn't do it. But just going back and looking at how they've approached first round picks since the 2011 CBA, right, where you're, 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 you want to see what these guys can do so you can figure out as soon as you can, if you're going to sign them to a second contract, they haven't wasted any time in getting those guys into the lineup. So, you know, go back to Bud Dupree, TJ Watt. I mean, I know Terrell Edmonds. I, I know there was an injury to Morgan Burnett that year, but mm-hmm. Edmund, even even Terrell Edmonds, probably the worst draft pick, um, a, a first round pick of the last, you know, five to seven years, even he ended up starting an, an entire season. So the trend is to get those guys out there to see what they do, you know, sort of a sink or swim situation. So I, I would forecast, unless Broderick Jones um, isn't up to it, you know, for whatever reason, and there might be reasons. I mean, listen, he's only started 19 games in college. We all know it's kind of a light resume. He doesn't turn 22 until July, I don't think. So there could be reasons that happen, but it just looking at recent history, Chris, I, I think they're going to give him – every opportunity to do that. And I think we'll have plenty of chances to, to, to make that happen up in Latrobe. 
I want to talk more about the challenges of protecting Kenny Pickett this year with not just those games, but the games are going to have to face some, some of the better pass rushers all season long. We'll talk more about that on the North Shore Drive podcast with, with Chris Carter and Ray Fittipato in just a minute here. But before we do that, I want to talk to you guys about GameTime.co, the number one place that you got to go <laughs> to to buy tickets for your favorite events. And buying tickets shouldn't be stressful. That's what Game Time's here to do. And if you download the Game Time app, you're going to find the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets, you get their best price guarantee and with the best price guarantee you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you're about to have again download the game time app you can book tickets up to the last minute for your favorite events near you and you can get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football basketball baseball concerts comedy theater and much much more the game time guarantee means that you'll always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section and same row of the same event for less game time will credit you 110 percent of the difference snag the tickets without the stress with game time download the game time app create an account and use code pitt pit for twenty dollars off your first purchase or go to their website gametime.co and again that's that's, that's code pitt pit for twenty dollars off your first purchase of 150 dollars or more terms and conditions apply down the go game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed <laughs> Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast, Chris Carter here with Ray Fittipaldo, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Let's continue our talk about the Steelers here and a little bit looking at pass protection here. Now, I'm going to pull up the schedule here for everyone to see. Uh, this is the schedule that the Steelers have uh, through, throughout, the, throughout the 2023 season. We talked about those first four games. You got the Niners, the, the Browns, the, the Raiders, the Texans, all of them with edge rushers that have made that have big names, even a rookie in, for the Texans there. But I'm looking at this schedule. You see Josh Allen and the Jaguars in, in, in week eight. You got Green Bay. They added Lucas Van Ness, uh, a, a guy that you had slotted to the Steelers in your first your first uh, mock draft. Uh, and then, of course, you got Miles Garrett coming back again. Trey Hendrickson and the Bengals pass rush for two games this season. There's a lot. There's going to be a lot of challenges to protect Kenny Pickett this year. And Ray, he went through two head injuries last year. What do the Steelers need to do? Or maybe it's what is Kenny? Is it more on Kenny Pickett to protect himself in those type of matchups? Well, I think a little bit of it is on Kenny Pickett for sure. I mean, he added 13 pounds over the offseason. He wanted to build himself into a stronger person so maybe he could absorb the beating a little bit better. I mean, we all know headshots are headshots. If you fall wrong, you can get a concussion. I mean, that, right. you know, putting on weight doesn't prevent that. But the point is he tried over the offseason to make himself a bigger and stronger football player. And I think that will help some just in terms of um, – you know, getting hit and things of that sort. Um, but when you look in the big picture, Chris, I think they concentrated on the left side of their offensive line over the offseason. Um, you know, for right now, it looks like Mason Cole, James Daniels, and Chooks of Horfor will remain intact center in the right side. But the left side is going to be completely different. If you look at the, the pass pro numbers and uh, the, the penalties on that side of the line, it's, it's not hard to see why they wanted to switch those guys out. So uh, Dan Moore, um, I haven't looked it up recently. I want to say he allowed six or seven sacks last year, according to PFF. He was among the top five or ten most penalized offensive linemen in the NFL. Kevin Dotson at left guard, um, he didn't give up six or seven. I want to say he gave up four or five, and he also was among the most penalized um, guards in the league last season. So – when you look at it, you know, um, giving up sacks, getting penalized, putting your team behind the change, um, that's that's no good. So, I, you know, I think with Isaac Sayamalu coming in and Broderick Jones eventually coming in, as we just talked about, I think they wanted to shore up that pass protection. I think both of those guys too, Chris, are really good run blockers. You know, it's not mm-hmm. that Dan Moore and, and Kevin Donson weren't – they didn't have their moments. I mean, they were, they were fine, but – you upgrade not only in pass pro, but I think you upgrade with run blocking uh, when you insert Isaac Sayamalu and Broderick Jones into that lineup. Among all offensive linemen, according to Pro Football Focus, Kevin Dotson had the seventh most penalties last year uh, with, with 12 on the season. And like you said, Dan Moore Jr., not too far behind, 10th 
uh, overall. That's tied for 16th uh, as far as having the most in the, in the NFL last year. Um, and then again, when you go when you go and look at the Steelers and you and you ask like, okay, where did Kenny Pickett take the most hits from? Um, it does come from those those two right there, Kevin Dotson. Uh, Dan Moore Jr. gave up seven sacks. Kevin Dotson gave up four. That's 11 of the 21 sacks the Steelers allowed last year, more than half. So, you know, you look at you look at that. Yeah, that's a big part of what they're trying to do here. And I think it's, you know, one thing we saw, Kenny Pickett was getting the ball out quick a lot. That was part of their strategy. They wanted to not just protect him, but protect the team from turnovers, from big mistakes and everything like that. I, I just I wonder with the investment now in a Broderick Jones, and again, we'll see if he does start week one and if he gets thrown into that gauntlet, but also Isaac Samalo, will Matt Canada, will Mike Tom, will they be willing to kind of open it up a little bit more and let Kenny Pickett sit in the pocket with plays and route concepts and that are <laughs> more designed to have time to develop, or will they try to protect him, especially early on with those teams that we've been talking about? Yeah, I mean, you're not gonna tune into the Steelers this year and see the Kansas City Chiefs or the Cincinnati Bengals in terms of how much they're passing. But I do think they're going to have to pick their spots, right? I mean, they're going right. to have to throw the football more. Um, I think they were, what, tied for 26th in scoring last season with 18.1 mm -hmm. points per game. Um, you know, Kenny Pickett threw five touchdowns um, in the final eight games of the season when the Steelers went 6-2. and two. Mm -hmm. That's fine, but I don't think that's sustainable, Chris, if you want to be Not. a true playoff contender. I mean, Patrick Mahomes, uh, five touchdowns, he can do that in three quarters. You know, yeah, he really can. He can do it in one if he wanted to. We yeah. see him go crazy. Yeah. So I mean, I get it. You know, he cut down on cut down on the picks and so on and so forth. I get it. But if you want to be a team that's a serious playoff contender, you can't score 18 points a game. I mean, they got to get that up to 21, 22. Um, you know, see if they can continue to play great defense. Um, but make no mistake, they're going to run the ball, Chris. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they want to be a team that uh, – I don't want to say they're a run-first team, but they want certainly want to be a team that runs the ball efficiently. And I think if they could do that, um, you know, the, the second half of the season, we kind of saw it to play action a little bit more. Receivers were running open a little bit more than they were in the first half. I think mm -hmm. that's because that running game got established a little bit better than it did in the first half. So if you could do that over the course of the season, I think that play action will be there. New weapons, you know, Darnell Washington is in. We'll see how that works. But um, a good cast of characters coming back too. So you would think with guys like George Pickens and Pat Fryermuth and Deontay Johnson that you can score more than 18 points a game. But to your point, you got to put the ball in Kenny Pickett's hands a little bit more and trust him in order for that to happen. I agree. I agree. And trusting him, it, it, it's, it's that two-way street of that double, the, the double-edged sword of yeah, trusting him, but also trusting the line there and trusting everything to kind of be able to protect him uh, from those big hits. But like you said, Kenny Pickett's added weight. I also think his experience is huge in this, right? Because this is a guy who last year he was, you know, he had that nook that he was studying plays and he was, you know, figuring out what it's like to adapt to the NFL on top of making sure he had a full comprehension of the Steelers playbook. Now he's been working all off season in private workouts with it, with his teammates and trying to be you have that chemistry that he wants to have with with his players like he did when he played for Pitt. Um, and those are all going to be challenges that he faces. But now he'll have experience with him. I, I just think one of the major objectives here. Yes. Running the football, I think, will be a, the biggest factor of this offense. Like you said, not maybe not run all the time and run first, but this will be a team that I think that looks to grind like to grind you out. Just like you were saying there with Najee Harris, with Jalen Warren, with this offensive line they'd have invested in. Uh, and even with guys like Darnell Washington, but off of that has to come, come off play action. It, you know, that has to be the, the option to get guys open for Kenny Pickett to see them, to get, to get open looks and to not put as much pressure on him to be the pinpoint passer, to be like Patrick Mahomes. I think it's, it's an acknowledgement that the Steelers have is that, hey, like, you know, not everybody can be Patrick Mahomes. Not everyone can be Josh Allen. Not everyone can be Tom Brady. You, know, you need to be able to – it's okay to have a really good quarterback and a team that doesn't necessarily focus completely around them. And I think that that's what they're trying to at least set Kenny Pickett up for in his first years in the NFL. So, you know, saying all that, I think that, again, the pass protection – it's a big part of this, but also a lot of this is going to be on Kenny Pickett making the smart moves and them trusting him to make the smart moves. Yeah, I mean, again, they're not going to want to throw the ball 40 or 45 times a game, but it's all about picking your spots, right? Like, when is the right time 
uh, to maybe open it up a little bit. You know, the element of surprise. Maybe you come right. off throwing one game, um, and, and then maybe you, you you close it out with the run. I mean, there's all different types of circumstances that they'll encounter over the course of a 17-game season. But, again, it's not going to be the volume of the passes. Um, I don't think they want to put Broderick Jones or Kenny Pickett in a situation where they have to drop back and, and throw the ball 40 to 45 times a game. But you have to have that within your arsenal. At some point during the season to be a playoff contender, you have to be able to go out there and score 21, 24, 27 points uh, to beat some of the teams they're going to be competing with um, in the AFC. We talked about it last week with the schedule. Um, you know, it's not a daunting schedule, but the AFC is stacked. I mean, it, it's going to be a really good conference this year. They're in a really good division, so they're going to have to score points. And I think um, Broderick Jones is going to have to be up to the challenge. Kenny Pickett's going to have to be up to the challenge. And perhaps most importantly, Matt Cannon is going to have to be up to the challenge to make sure all of this works. Absolutely. We'll have more talk about that as, as the offseason rolls along. Rookie camp's over, and mini, mini camp and OTAs will be starting up very soon, next week, in fact, as far as when the Steelers resume uh, public practices that we can cover. He's Ray Fittipaldo uh, here of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, one of our great Steelers beat writers. Thanks so much, Ray, for your time. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Jason Mackey, we're going to talk about what the heck are the Pirates doing at catcher? Why can't they just bring up one of these guys that we've been so hyped up about? That, Mitch Keller, and how the Pirates can, can, can try to bounce back as they get ready to take on the Detroit Tigers this week before they come back home for two straight home stands. Stick with us here on the North Shore Drive podcast. More Pittsburgh sports coming right at you. We're back here on the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, on the Monday episode here. And we're joined now by Jason Mackey. We just got done talking Steelers. Let's talk about some Pirates. Jason, before we get into Mitch Keller and how the Pirates were able to kind of, you know, not get swept by the Orioles there, I want to talk about something that you've that you've thought that you've put your thoughts out there about, and that's the catcher situation for the Pirates and how Austin Hedges just ain't getting it done. And I got to know. When is when are they going to do something about that? They've got guys in the minors. They have got guys that they've they're developing that they've developed who are meant to take that spot. When is it going to be time to make that move? I know, Chris. I know, and this is something. I think this is like question number one for the fan base right now. And here's where I stand on it. And I'm going to apologize ahead of time if the rant is long. But go like, ahead, rant. This is my <laughs> this is my assessment of it. I don't see a need to move Austin Hedges right now. I know that like. Fans want to get him out of there. They look at the batting average. He really does add value for this team. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you don't want to move on to Hedges? I'm, I don't. I'm, I don't. <laughs> okay, I don't. Ahead, it's okay. Sorry. It's okay. But I don't agree with everything they're doing right now. And here's why. Okay. Okay. Um, you're keeping Henry Davis, a 23-year-old college kid, picked 1-1 overall in AA. Why? He's dumb. He, he's, he's hitting the cover off the ball. He's having a really good start. I would reward him, move him up to AAA. Their argument, Ben Charrington said this on 93.7 The Fan yesterday, is that they want him to catch. Okay, well, he only caught two days last week. They played him twice in right field. If he has to catch, why is he not catching? I don't understand that. So there's more parts to this too, right? Andy Rodriguez is in AAA. Andy Rodriguez has been good. He hasn't been great though thus far. So like the people calling for him to be promoted to the major leagues, I think you need to stand off of that a little bit. Like he's hitting 250. I'm going to wait for him to figure it out at the plate before I move him up to the major leagues. That's why I'm saying keep Austin Hedges. But what you need to do is find a way to get this working long term, right? Like these guys at some point are going to have to work together. Either one guy is a primary, they share the reps, whatever. Let's figure it out now. Get them both to AAA. Henry needs a challenge. Like that's the move that I want to see them make is promote Henry Davis to AAA and either commit to one guy. Maybe it's Henry Davis as your primary catcher, and then you're going to take Andy Rodriguez and you're going to say, Here's second base. Here's first base. Here's the outfield. You do whatever. But let's start getting them used to playing with one another and get that timeshare, whatever you want to call it. Let's get that in place. And so whenever they're both ready, and maybe that's soon. I hope that's soon. I hope they show me that it's soon. Mm -hmm. Then I bring them both up. I, I feel you on this. I mean, I, I get it. And then there's patience that needs to be involved. There's a lot of things that in the long term, it's just it's the, it's the thing where, you know, the Pirates – 
they've been on this they've been on this slump and it's it's natural to want like a jump start something that's sure. just gonna sure. kick them into the next gear so they can get out of the funk that they're in we'll get to the how, how they might do that with their upcoming series in a little bit but let's talk about something that is positive and that's mitch keller he's pitched back-to-back shutouts now he's five and one on this on the season and the more and more that i look at at, at how at how he's pitching i mean this was the guy who, you know, one of the guys that were being promised to Pirates fans for years that, oh, he's going to be the guy. He now has, and he, he's going to be the guy. And everyone's wondering, well, when will he be the guy? Well, now he has 69 strikeouts. Nice. And he's third in uh, in all of Major League Baseball in, in, in strikeouts right now. And he's living up to the hype, at least in, in, in his last several starts here. What's he doing right that's now manifesting? Everything. Can I answer that way? (laughs) (laughs) It's incredible, Chris. It really is. I mean, I'll get into a more detailed explanation than that. Um, He's just gotten so good, man. Uh, We talked to him in Baltimore after his most recent gem. Um, You know, we're talking about like a year ago because it's almost a year to the day now where he was banished to the bullpen, didn't know what was going to happen. It was in Chicago, Um, you know, has two outings there and then gets back into the starting rotation with the sinker. But he's like, honestly, I was just trying to have a job. I was just trying to have a uniform. Um, that's how in dire straits this kid's career was. And now look at him. Like I spent the yeah. morning looking up some of these stats. Um, his ERA right now, Chris, is just absolutely nuts. It's the same as Framber Valdez, 2.3. Whoa. Better than Spencer Strider, better than Shane Bieber, a little Jeez. bit below Shane McClanahan, Zach Gallen, and Clayton Kershaw. I mean, that's where Mitch is right now. Um, if you trace back to last May, he's better than Sandy Alcantara from the Marlins, reigning NL Cy Young Award winner. Like He's been so incredible. How he's been doing it, it's been fastball usage, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, his four-seamer was a, an abyss before. It was really bad. It was really hittable. Um, I don't know what – I think 313 and 495 is what opponents hit and slugged against that pitch in 2021 when Mitch really took it on the chin. They're not touching it this year. 167 mm. and 267. I mean, it's just – he's setting it up with his cutter. He's setting it up with his sinker. He basically throws three hard pitches – They'd all go in different places. And you don't know where they're going for a very long time. He's throwing 96, 97. And then you've got three off-speed pitches off of that. So, anyway, it's a long-winded way of saying he's doing a lot of things very right. And it sounds like it. I mean, I have six pitches you're talking about there that you can put in different directions. That 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 can complicate things. And yes, he's he has an ERA of 238 right now. Uh, that's you know, that's 12th best in the majors right now spectacular now the pirates do need more to help him he can't just be the only guy that gets doves out here they're going to need to, some help with that let's look forward a little bit here they got an upcoming series that uh you i believe you'll be going on the road for this one again yep yep this is so, another weird one where i come home for a day and then i leave tonight i, I, I actually come home to do mother's day with with my mom's coming over and then i drive to detroit tonight so it's a weird one such well, such life well, they they're headed to Detroit for uh, for for two quick games there, uh, six forty p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, and then an afternoon game at one ten p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, they'll be on the MLB Network, actually, by the way. Uh, but this is now a chance to go to go, to kind of re- rebalance things again. Here, they were able to at least get a game in the last two series, so that they could at least not be swept in back to back series series like here again. But now, I think it's going to be a question as far as how do they handle you know, another team that they should be, that they, they should be able to, I think, uh, compete against. Now, the Tigers, they're not utterly terrible. They do have a losing record right now. They're they're sitting in the, in the middle of the AL Central. Uh, but what are the things that they have to do to be better than this team and maybe make this the first series that they've won since late April? Yeah, a couple things, Chris. Um, one, hitting with runners in scoring position. Yesterday, mm-hmm. G1 Bay came up big in that situation early on. Not that he crushed the ball, but he found a hole through the right side, knocked in two runs with two outs. Um, they, they just haven't had that sort of stuff go their way. And if you look at the numbers uh, for the entire season, the Pirates are pretty good with runners in scoring position. But over the past 12 or 13 games, it's really gone in the tank. They need to produce in that situation, produce in the clutch. I also look at some of the pitching matchups, and they really intrigue me. Luis Ortiz goes on Tuesday night. He was okay his first time out. I think there's a lot more there. Um, Vince Velasquez is going to be back in short order. Curious to see what Luis does, whether he's able to sort of put a foot down and say, I'm going to stay in the starting rotation. I don't know. Uh, Wednesday's pitching matchup is a good one. Um, Rich Hill opposite Eduardo Rodriguez. And Eduardo Rodriguez has actually been better than Mitch Keller. In the American League, obviously, 
but has just been flat out dominant. I want to say he's given up like one run in his past 35 innings or something like that. It's, wow. it's insane. 157 ERA. So anyway, it, it's not going to be easy. That second one's going to be tough. Um, I know Rich Hill is going to be wanting to get back and, and perform better than he did last time. Remember his error there opened the door for a big inning. But, you know, I, I would think they – Probably eyeing a sweep, and you want to at least split here, Chris. I don't. I don't think they want to go backwards. At some point, they need to get some traction here, get some momentum. They can't just be winning the games that Mitch Keller starts. No, I agree. And this is part of what you and I talked about a month ago, where I was like, "Hey, a slump is coming." We don't. We didn't. Know, we didn't know it come like this in May, but we knew in baseball, all teams deal with it. You're going to deal deal with it, and because of their success in April. They're still afloat. They're second in the NL Central right now. They're second in the wild card in the wild card uh, race race right now. So like they're still in a in a decent position. They're three games above five hundred. So if they can wake out of this slump and kind of get back, and they can even just play five hundred ball for a bit, they'll stay afloat. There'll be some belief there. They can they they can keep it going. So I'm right with you that they need to figure that out here. And if you figure that out here, you got six games at home after that in a row. Uh, first against the Diamondbacks for three, and then you got the the Rangers for three. Um, and you know maybe that can be part of your 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 journey back, right? Like you're tr- you're trying to get there. Now the Diamondbacks been playing been playing pretty well, so have the Texas Rangers. But if you can get a start here against a team like Tigers, find some traction, find some synergy. Maybe the bats come a little bit alive. Saw them cut throw up the Zoltan again. I was like, what's up with that? <laughs> uh, I was like, that bring are we bringing it back? Are we bringing it back? But if they can get something going here against a team that they need to stand up against, maybe in these, in these next couple of home stands, they'll be able to kind of, I think, put a better play, a sh- better show together and build some confidence. Yeah. And that's been one thing that's been hard about covering these guys, right? Like they were never as good as they showed early on and they teased everybody and got expectations high. And everybody's like grading this team as if they're a playoff team. Right. And then they go in the toilet and they stink for a dozen games. And then everybody's saying, Oh, it's the same old pirate. Like, you're jumping to two irrational conclusions there. Right. They're never as good as they were. They look during a 28 or 20 and eight start. And they're not the worst baseball team ever assembled. The truth is somewhere right. in the middle. And I I'm looking forward to that leveling out. And you can look at how they've played baseball and say that, you know, these things are good and these things are bad. You know what I mean? Like, you need to make routine plays. They haven't made enough of them. You can't make so many outs on the bases. They've done that. They've done, they've done that too much. Like the back end of their bullpen has been very good. Mitch Keller has been very good. Vince Velasquez, when healthy, has been very good. Um, you've, you've seen some good signs, right? And you've also seen some things that they need to improve on. So I, don't, I guess what I'm saying is this is my life and their life and whatever. Like the season is so long. Just you, you yeah. can't even understand how long it is and how much stuff changes. And I try to caution people all the time, like, don't overreact to like a week. I promise you, it will change. Things will change. And we're seeing that now. I think they're going to start playing better baseball, Chris. I really do. This thing is bound to turn in a positive direction, and it could start as early as tomorrow. Could start. We'll see. We'll see if it does. Jay, he's Jason Mackey. He will be in Detroit covering both of those games, and then back here covering the homestand here as the Pirates try to turn things around here in the mid month of May. Thanks so much, Jason, for joining us. Thank you to Ray Fittipato for all for all the Steelers coverage we get there as well. Thanks and thank you all for checking out the North Shore Drive podcast here with the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter. You can get all of our content at post gazettecom or if you want more podcasts specifically, go to our podcasting audio your favorite podcasting app. Look up the North Shore Drive podcast. Look up the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. You can download the audio there, or you can watch us here on YouTube. Subscribe to this channel to get all of the daily content that comes out here, as well as the Monday, Wednesday, Friday episodes of the North Shore Drive podcast. Again, I'm Chris Carter. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. We'll be back on, on this screen Wednesday, breaking things down. How do they do in Detroit? How do they look coming back home? We'll find out about the Pirates, and then we'll keep updating you about the Steelers as well. Stick with us. We'll see you then. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you're watching this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down below in the description.